All right, it's BJ Balls Out Comedy Podcast. How you doing, Jordy? I'm good, Benny. How are you? you ah, not too bad. And today we've got a special guest and uh, awesome to have him on, Mr. Chris Franklin. How are you going? Benny, Jordy, how are you going, boys? Yeah, not too bad. It's an absolute honour to have you on, man. I've been a fan, <laughs> fan for a long time. Me and my, me and my mates used to flog the absolute crap out of your single when we were in uh, <laughs> primary school. It was even funnier because my mate, my best mate's name was Robbo, so and, um, it was good. Not a lot of people know that Robbo in the song was actually a girl I was written at the time called Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Robbo's a chick. Oh. Very good. Friend, very good friends of benefits. It's good. <laughs> It's actually quite impressive that I, I, I looked at the video for, for a recap just before. Um, I think it was re-uploaded maybe seven years ago and it's already already on a million, million something views, which is damn impressive for a video that came out before like, you know, YouTube was really a staple. Yeah, that's incredible. Every Australia Day and Anzac Day gets a bit of a run around the country. Yeah. And it hasn't been a- hasn't been available on Spotify or any of those things up until this week, then um, YouTube's the only place that they can see it. Oh, that's good. Oh, excellent. Smart. Hang on, my cat's just tangled up my fucking headphones. One second. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Like, we've, we've, we've basically seen now, you, you've basically come out with a new, new parody, um, you know, which is uh, pretty good, and you've pulled in a shitload of people to help out with that one, which is awesome and great to see. Not actually a parody, Benny. It's an original, that one. When well, yeah. All right. Sorry. Yeah, an original, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you killed it. I mean, it's fucking awesome. Love it. Oh, it's pretty handy when you've got people who can actually sing helping you out with it. <laughs> <laughs> speaking, speaking, speaking of bloke, I just want to touch on that first. Um, am, I, am I right in uh, spotting a, a familiar face there in, in Arne Doe? Yeah, Arn, Arn was just starting out in comedy and um, was a mate. I've met him. He was from Sydney, but I've met him in Melbourne doing some gigs. Yeah. He was doing some middle bracket open mic stuff down there. Himself and Mick Meredith, actually, they were both really good mates if you're into uh-huh. comedy. Um, yeah, and uh, Arn moved on a little bit. My manager, who I'd had for a couple of years there, Artie Lang from A-List, um, spotted something in Arn and took him on for management and... Um, the, the video clip was shot in Canberra, where my manager was based at the time. Yep. So it was pretty easy to get some guys to come down from Sydney, and Arm was one of them. Oh, that's brilliant. Mm. And, um, I don't know if I'm letting any sort of cat out of the bag here, but in one of the very last scenes when it's going past the, um, the Hills Hoist, there seems to be a balaclava of sorts. Did Tism have anything to do with this? No, mate, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading way too much into it. A lot of people um, seem to think I was part of TISM, and even if I was, I couldn't tell you. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will let you know that the, the balaclava is there representing. Um, I still do a joke, but I don't use balaclava anymore um, with the bogan attire, and I, I have the summer uniform and the winter uniform, and I, I say, um, uh, normally when I do this joke, I've got a beanie on and the, um, when we go shopping, we wear it like this and I pull it down. It's a balaclava. <laughs> I used to do it with an actual balaclava, but I, I just act it out nowadays because I've, I've lost too many balaclavas and it's too hard to find. <laughs> uh, ski shops, if you need one, they've, they, they've got them. Uh, I'll clear my name right now. They're really good for paintballing. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's all I use for. Yeah, right, eh, Jordy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite it. That, that might have been, I didn't even think about it, that might have been why uh, people assumed I was in TISM because it was a, just a, a subtle Easter egg in the in the bloke video. But, That's a uh, fucking old Easter egg. That's a 20-year-old <laughs> Easter egg. It's brilliant. <laughs> that, That's still probably 10 years after TISM, mate. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no shit. Oh, I just thought maybe you know, because you know, it's a it's it's a it's a cover parody. You can't use like the original music. You'd have to use like a karaoke version or you know, record your own sort of thing. I thought, oh, maybe, oh fuck, maybe Tism was in the background. But, uh, <laughs> no, all right, well that that would have been cool. You could have broken that here first, but never mind. Uh, that, that'll never get broken. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> First rule of autism is don't talk about it. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. So, what 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 have you been up to with your downtime apart from uh, releasing some original material? Um, nothing really. I, I, to me, this ISO time has been no different to being in between tours or gigs because I live in Tasmania. I've, I'll I'll organise my my runs where I. There's not a lot of work down here, so I'll go to the mainland and do a run of comedy clubs or a run of regional theatres or whatever for, for 10 days, 14 days. Yep. And I'll come home for a week and just chill at home and hide in my place and do nothing. Um, it's, it's been just an extended period between gigs for me. Yeah, that's fair enough. Like, yeah. It's been good. that <laughs> <laughs> I got the shits one day because people were out everywhere and I wrote that poem and put it on Facebook and then said it could be a song in the last verse. That was actually my wife's suggestion. She said, uh, you should sing the last verse. So I did that. And then uh, a fellow called Robert E. Kelly released his musical version on the piano in, in um, a place called Ringe in, in New Hampshire in America. Oh, wow. And crazy. And... Uh, we got in contact with each other and I'd already started putting the band together, the 23 piece band for, for my rock version of it. And I invited Bob to be a part of ours as well. So, and that's, that's where it ended up. I, I ended up being <laughs> after 22 years of traveling around the country and the world, getting on stage, doing stand up comedy, trying to get my name out there. It took two weeks of isolation for me to become world famous. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least you're not suggesting people, you know, inject uh, disinfectants or anything. So there's, yeah. there's a better way to be famous. Is, and... is that not a good thing? Because I had my first hit today. <laughs> the, the bleach, yeah, fuck. <laughs> people will start doing a Breaking Bad soon. They'll start baking bleach to oh, turn into ice or something. Fuck that. Um, no, it's that's not... my brain. I, I keep thinking I'm on a podcast with the word balls in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so, are you drinking Furphy out of a VB holder? Yeah, well, I, I've, I've drank all my Jack Daniels and VB and we had <laughs> Michelle's uh, brother and sister-in-law over for dinner the other night. And I think they're Carlton's actually. They're not Firths. But he left some beers in the fridge. Carlton dry it is. Oh yeah, how, how do you how do you stack that up against VB? Oh it's shit, but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you tried Furphy yet? Yeah, I tried one once, I couldn't I couldn't finish it. I, I, I when I'm forced to try another beer, I will, but I never enjoy them, so I always go back to the the VB. I'd, I'd be better off drinking bleach like Donald Trump's. <laughs> <laughs> what about spirits? Are you into your spirits or JD? I just, just finished a bottle of JD. That's why I'm on the on the yeah. now because I've got no more JD. I only drink what I can spell: BB or JD. Four <laughs> <laughs> extra got me far. <laughs> oh, it's good to stick to what you know. It's very good. Yeah, really. <laughs> it's a healthy, healthy way of living. Do you reckon the um like you you've obviously been drinking a lot longer than I have, but uh, has the taste of VB changed over the years, do you reckon? It changed and then it changed back. They changed the recipe. Yeah. Oh, they put the tapes, did they? Um, it, it went from being Australia's number one selling beer to number two behind Forex when they, they changed the recipe. Oh, and um, they, they took the people's uh, people who spoken on board and um, changed it back to how it was. Wow. I, I mean, I've drunk it all the way through. I, I'm... It's like a footy team. You don't, your beer's like a footy team. You don't change. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, so where did you, I mean, uh, where did you start? I mean, where did, where, did, where did it all begin for you? I mean. I was oh, probably 97. I'd just come back from Western Australia where I'd spent three months living in an alcohol rehabilitation centre. And um, I don't know why. Um <laughs> Made my way by bus back to Victoria where my family was. None of them wanted to know me and I found myself homeless in Melbourne. Sure. Um, then uh, wandering into a pub in Richmond, Deadwood's Tavern in Richmond, I bumped into a comedian called Chris Bennett who had been on a TV show called Hey Hey It's Saturday. I, I knew 
he was a famous guy as far as I was concerned. Yeah. And um, he, he was with a couple of mates and uh, I, I just went over and went, oh, you're that famous comedian. Here's a joke. Here's another joke. Here's a joke. Here's another joke. Reeled off a, a whole lot of 1980s Kalalia <laughs> routines to him. And uh, he bought me a beer, so I stayed for a while. <laughs> he said, if you like your comedy that much, I annoyed him for about eight hours. Um, he said, if you like your comedy that much, come down to this place in St Kilda called the Espy on Sunday. I'm hosting a comedy show. I'll put your name on the door. You can watch it for free. Uh -huh. I thanked him and I, I went down there on the Sunday. My name was on the door and I went backstage to say thanks. And he said, you're here. Good, you're on. And he threw me on stage at the Espy with no preparation, no anything. So my maiden five minutes was once again a, a 17 minute Cole Elliott recital. Sure. Uh, uh, Cole writes some good jokes. So I came off thinking I was the king of comedy. And um, <laughs> then the promoter said, that wasn't bad. Next time write your own stuff. And I went, oh, <laughs> you do that. <laughs> but I, yeah, I got the bug from that. And um, yeah, uh, the following April, I won Triple J's raw comedy competition. Uh, yep. Standing on the stage at the Melbourne Town Hall, still pretty well homeless. Um, oh, okay. won, won a trip to the Edinburgh Comedy Festival, and all the open mic comics I'd met at that time. Um, who were they around then? Yeah, Dave Hughes, yeah. Rove McManus, Bev Kelly. They were all saying to me, Are you going to go to Edinburgh? You're, you're homeless. I said, Well, I may as well be fucking homeless over there as over here. You know? <laughs> 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 I'll get a feed and a free beer on the plane on the way. <laughs> Jeez. So yeah, that, that's how it all started. And after after winning Raw, there, there was offers coming everywhere. Two years after that, bloke came out, and from bloke, I'd uh, earned enough money to buy a two-story, four-bedroom house on a tropical island in North Queensland <laughs> <laughs> that the ex-wife is still fucking living in. Oh, <laughs> I was waiting for the butt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, that sucks. Sorry to hear that. So, so how did you, how did you, I mean, it was all sort of, it sort of evolved very quickly for you. I mean, did you sort of have to sort of, how did you work out the writing part of it? I mean, did you just start looking at yourself, looking at ideas? You yeah, being... a lot of people do the writing bit very differently. I'll just adjust that camera because I'm sitting forward and getting serious. Um, like, Comics like Will Anderson will write a new hour every year for a festival run or whatever. Um, I, I don't even write my jokes down. I, I think of something funny. Um, I'll, I'll say it on stage. If, if I can't get the audience to see what I saw as funny in that joke, I'll try it three different times wording it differently each time. If they, if they don't go with me by the third time, I just drop it. It's gone. But yeah, n normally I'm, I'm pretty lucky. I've, I've worked out what they like. So if I, if I think it's funny, I'll work out how to tell them so they enjoy it. Nowadays, it's 22 years in, though. But, yeah, um, having one raw, I, I, I probably had at that stage 15 minutes of material from different open mic spots, and all of a sudden people wanted me to headline. So I had to get an hour or at least 40 minutes together very quickly. And um, Yeah, shit. Over 22 years, I, I, I still feel like I'm doing about 90% of that original hour. I, I haven't written a lot since I got that first hour up. But having said that, I, I looked at my DVD, which was released 15 years ago, and there's probably only 10 minutes of that hour that I'm still using. So I am writing, but I've, I'm not writing a new show. There's a joke that comes in and something might drop out, and yeah. I don't realise that it's changed so much over the years. Oh, it's not. Mm. And, and I mean, how did the how did your character come about? I mean, it, it, to a point, it is a bit of a character. I, I grew up in Crib Point, about twenty k south of Frankston. It's not a character. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is me. I, I've got a hoodie on at the moment. I've got my stubby holder. I'm wearing my thongs at the moment in Tasmania. It's fucking. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it's just me. I tell everyone the mullet's not a hairstyle; it's a lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> but it, here's my desk you reckon i've got a character here's i'll turn this around that i've got a vb bar mat on my desk <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's brilliant so, there we go get that hand out of the way <laughs> what 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 would you say would be the highlight of your career so far um quite a few things uh 
bloke going to number one was pretty special, although at the time I didn't realise it was special because I'd never been a, a singer or a recording artist before. I just brought out a song and three weeks later it was at number one. So yeah. I thought that's that's what happens with everyone. But uh, it wasn't until I reached the, released the second single and nothing came of that that I realised how special the first one was. Yeah. Um, uh, Getting my name inside a bit of trivia in a VB stubby lid was a pretty big highlight. Oh, shit. <laughs> Some comedians want their name up in lights. I just wanted to be in a VB. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you find that out? Did you, uh, did you twist the top yourself or did someone tell you? Uh, someone sent me a photo of it. So um, I'm, I'm a can drinker generally. I'm, I'm not yeah. a, a, a stubby drinker. Reason being, I, I used to drink a lot of stubbies, but um, the... They're in a, a dark glass, but they still get affected by the sunlight, I've found. Yeah. So, yeah, in cans are always the same. So I switched to cans very quickly. Yeah. So it took me a long time to actually get the actual stubby lid with my name. And it's quite cool. It says um, two two songs in the history of Australian music have gone to number one that mentioned VB. One was I Was Only 19 by Red Gum, and the other oh. one was Bloke by Chris Franklin. So, I'm in pretty good company there. That's awesome. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> uh, if anyone's listening out there and you find another one, can you send it to us so we can send it to Chris? Because that'd yeah. be. I've, I've got a couple of sent here now. Thank you. <laughs> I do. <laughs> That's awesome. Excellent. I mean, it'd be one thing to see, it'd be another thing to actually have it. Uh, yeah, that's really yeah. cool. Mm. That's brilliant. That's another <laughs> highlight. Um, Singing bloke in the middle of the MCG to 60,000 people. That was quite exciting. Yeah. Grand final day? No, it wasn't grand final. So oh. It would have been 120,000 there then. Oh. <laughs> Just a home and away game. Ironically, Richmond Football Club had employed me to do it and they were playing North Melbourne on the day, which was the team I barracked for. Mm -hmm. So they said, do you want to come in and meet the players before the game? And I said, no, I want to go and meet the North Melbourne players. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I sung it. I sung a poor Richmond in the middle of the MCG wearing a North Melbourne scarf. So I don't know if that would be that. <laughs> wonder if that's on YouTube. That'd be all right. <laughs> I don't think anyone had phones on their mobiles back then. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> bloke, was, bloke was released on CD and that was new technology. Oh, no, that's, that, that's still new technology to me. I can't stand streaming on, on more CDs. <laughs> It was, it was quite funny. I, I was on the boundary. There was a young fella there. said, oh, I bought your CD. It would have been 14 or something. I went, good on you, mate. And he had a friend next to him. I said, did you buy it too? He said, no, I just burned his. <laughs> <laughs> what nonsense. I was drinking for a minute, and then I realised when I was a teenager, we used to buy an album, an actual vinyl album for our friends for their birthday. But we'd yeah. recorded onto a cassette tape before we gave it to them anyway. <laughs> it was like seven version of burning a CD, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it would be. I, the amount of burnt CDs I had, unfortunately, but I, I think I've uh, taken that over now with not streaming. I buy everything, but I'm, I'm positive I had the CD. Single song. Yeah. Not, me and my mate had it, but yeah, no, it was very, it was very entertaining. Again, up on the wall up there, I don't know. If there's a platinum record for bloke up there. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> the Winnie's in there too. Fuck it, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and just down there behind the guitar, I don't know if you can see, is the gold one. It fell off the wall the other day. Oh shit! Is that, is that in the picture? I can't yeah, see. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next to me, Melbourne Storm and North Melbourne things. Very good. Are they thongs up the top? Yeah, and they were done by an Indigenous artist. Awesome. Oh, yeah, well, look at that. Yeah, Yeah. so uh, where am I? I can't see that little picture in the corner there. But yeah, no, no, let's bang on. Yeah, cool. So that's kind of cool. I've got these. We're doing a tour. <laughs> these are from um, when, when I did shows for the troops in the Middle East. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're in the Navy, yeah? That's right. Yeah, but this is an entertainer. I've, okay. Yeah, this is much later. The, the Middle Eastern conflict wasn't on when I was in the Navy. There was nothing on. It, so, yeah, that one's that one's Iraq. Yep. Uh, that's uh, East Timor, and that one's Afghanistan. Oh, wow. yeah. how, how did you find that, Chris? When you were over there, I mean, was it was it scary? I mean, did you sort of just go? I know, I know, you're sort of ex Navy and that that you know you want to do it for the troops and that but did you find it like fuck I've got to get over there and God knows what what's over there sort of thing or was it just like I'm doing it going there? 
Yeah, the, it, it wasn't something that was in my mind. For, firstly, so many entertainers had been before me and come back, and so I knew they looked after us, and we're pretty well wrapped in cotton wool while we're there. Um, secondly, I did have Navy experience. I have, I've had military experience, and a, a lot of training sort of was in my head. It yep. was many years after, but I was remembering as much as I could while I was there. Yep. So, yeah, I felt fairly comfortable the whole time, yeah. But what spun me out the most was the age of our troops over there. They were, they were all in their 20s. They were the same age as my kids. Gee, oh, wow. wow. Okay. Yeah, and there's, there was two fellas there, Snowy Moreland and Darren Smith, that watched a show of mine in Tarankot in Afghanistan one night, and they were both killed the next day. Oh, and, shit. Um, yeah, I, I never really met them. I know they were in the crowd at, at my show, but they're two names I'll never forget, you know. The two names I mentioned yesterday in um, on Anzac Day in a post. So. Oh, fuck, that's brutal. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Mm. Yeah. And then two nights after that, having to do another show to 500 Australian troops that have just found out two of their own have been killed, it's a bit hard to get a laugh out of them. I, I, I didn't disrespect those guys by trying to do comedy then. I just said, look, I'm affected like you guys are, and I didn't know, know these blokes. I'm just going to let the bands play tonight. I'm not going to do any comedy. And I got a round of applause for that. I don't know why, but yeah, there wasn't a time for doing jokes. Yeah, no, 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 no time to play. I was, I, that, that, that was, unfortunately, that leads me to my next question. Did you have to, before that happened, did you have to like uh, change any of your material? Like, do, do you get told what to say or what not to say? or? It, it all depends who uh -huh. you go with. I've gone three times to the Middle East. I've been to East Timor once and I've been to the Solomon Islands once. And um, it, it, some of the colonels that travel with you will say um, no swearing. We have Americans there. They don't like swearing, blah, blah, blah. And um, some of them will go, fuck them. They know what you do and they've employed you, you know, and the troops <laughs> will love it. You're here for the troops, not, not to impress anyone. You're here to, you know, entertain the troops. And they'll yeah. love it. This one particular colonel, I, I, I won't mention his full name, but ironically, he was a robbo as well. <laughs> he, he had my sense of humour. He'd walk around the base over there with, with the, one of those um, brownie green military T-shirts that you see in all the movies and that. Yeah, yeah. And um, they're, they're not allowed to show rank or whatever, but, you know, okay. if they because they could be picked off, but he just had cunt written across the front of him. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all those less were in rank to him, had to salute as they went past. And he was <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. So, so, yeah, when he was running the tours, I was allowed to swear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. Have you ever had to... Have you had to apologise for a joke or anything while you've been entertaining the troops? Like, has something ever been set off Not guard? The no, no. I, I, I'm always respectful of, of anyone that serves for our country, men or women. So I, I, I would never say anything over there that would offend anyone anyway, you know? Yeah. Um, the one time I, I felt bad about a joke, I, I used to do a joke which was based on a true story of, of getting pulled over for drink driving. Yeah. And um, after the show, a guy came up he was in, waited in line patiently to buy a DVD like anyone else, but he wasn't buying a DVD. He waited till he was there in front of me and let me know that his son had been killed by a drink driver. Ooh. And it was respectful of me to, so I really felt like shit after that. Yeah, but um, once again, not the place for him to do that either. I understand as a grieving parent that he, he could have pulled me aside and said, look, maybe you don't do that because there's people like me out there. But, uh, and, and, before a show, I don't go around and meet my whole audience and find out if there's anything they don't want me to talk about. So, yeah, no, you can't. Did, did that? Did that sort of turn your? Uh, how can I put it? Like, did that that joke that you do about the drink driving? Did you sort of after that episode? Did you sort of go, I'm dropping this. Fuck it, I'm just going to keep going with it. Did you... I've been doing it for about ten years at that point, and that was the first time. And I, I remind myself of that, so I've continued to do it. But every time I tell him, I remember that guy. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, so, yeah. Part of the fun of comedy, comedy, I guess. You don't know who's in the audience and how it's going to be perceived. But um, His timing, like mine on that night, couldn't have been worse because uh, that was the uh, Thursday night intimate show 
in a small bar at the Deneliquin Blues and Roots Festival, where I was hosting on the main stage for all of Friday and Saturday, two 11 hour days. And oh, wow. so I, I did a one hour show at this smaller bar in the same complex first. He'd let me know there. And then I had two 11 hour days. He was standing in the audience somewhere watching me for the whole show. Yeah. Well, comedy's not for everyone. Uh, <laughs> we know that, but still, yeah, time and place. Yeah, that's right. That's quite rough. <laughs> I saw um, I saw I saw a picture a good a good mate of mine posted the other day. It was you and him uh, on tour many years ago. What was it like touring with Chris Winehouse? Oh, Winehouse is mental. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute brilliant mind, but um, yeah, if he can cut you down or or, um, or get you in trouble in any way, he will. <laughs> can you give us an example? Oh, just the other day on Facebook, he we weren't even touring, but um, he put a picture up of I had a, an ex-military friend who runs a gun club in um, outside of Carnarvon in Western Australia, in the middle of nowhere. Yep. We did a show at Carnarvon, so he invited us out the next day to, to fire some pistols at the at the range out there. Wayne House has got a photo of me and him with uh, handguns. I've got a Magnum, I think, uh, uh, shooting at the range. Shot from profile, so you can't see the forever range. It's just side on. <laughs> and he, he's put that up on Facebook uh, and said, remember that time we went shooting in Western Australia? And then the next photo he's got of me standing over a dead dugong that we saw on the <laughs> So, yeah, oh. I had about 15 comments on there trying to defend myself, saying they were two different incidents. <laughs> <laughs> and and his, post, his post was actually titled How to Fuck a Friend on Facebook. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, that's the kind of guy I weigh now. Says, I love him to death, but he's a brick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's oh. brilliant. How, how, how long did you go, guys go on tour for? We did a lot of different things. We still crossed paths quite a lot. Um, most memorable, we did a month in Melbourne, me, Chris, and Steady Eddie. In the, it was a show called Politically Incorrect. Yeah. So that, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, we did the one show together uh, for a month, every night for a month. It was great. Wow. Ooh. Fuck, that would have been intense. Did, did, you have to, did you do the same material every night or did you mix Pretty up just in case did. someone came? It's a little bit, it was a different setup. Like um, we had a couch at the side of the stage where if Wayne House was on out performing, Steady and I would be sitting at the side of the stage with, with microphones as well. Huh. We could just heckle him anytime we wanted or, or <laughs> <That's you know, laughs> like that. knowing that they could do the same when you were on stage too, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, no, it was, a, it was a good little setup. Whose idea was that? That's incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. I'd love to see that. Was it was a few years ago now. Yeah. We had the backing of um, Chug Entertainment. They'd funded the thing. So we had like billboards around Melbourne, the size of high rise buildings and all that sort of thing. And, and still couldn't pull a crowd as, as is the way at Melbourne Comedy Festival. So thankfully we were all on a wage for the show. And, and unfortunately they all lost a lot of money, but they spent a lot on it. Those billboards aren't cheap. Yeah, no, that that's a great idea though. That needs a reboot, I think. Mm. It was good oh, fun. Yeah. Well, first time I saw you was probably I reckon uh, twenty eighteen. I mean, I've seen you on TV and all the rest of it, but actually in person was at the Bear Pit. Um hosting the yeah, hosting. And I, love how, I love how you guys call it the Bear Pit. It's just another gig for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the way you, the, the, I said it to Geordie, the way you can control a crowd and when they get rowdy, and I mean, I love it. Like during the festival, I try to get there as much as I can just to watch the comedians and that. And the way you can control, and I've seen other people do the, when you're not around and they've done the room a couple of nights. Yeah, yeah. You know, off, and there's no, there's no comparison. Like the way you control it and the way other people have controlled it, Hands down, you always somehow just fucking bring them in, you know, like they, Thanks, you know, they get all rowdy and stuff, and 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 just the way you control a room. And I even saw a, a YouTube clip of um, 
I don't, it was the comics lounge, I think it was, and some guy was trying to come up and you were, you were trying to sort that of. Was in, I was at the um, Charles Hotel in Perth. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, little Italian guy. Little Italian guy, that's it. And the way the way you controlled that, it was just phenomenal. Like, you know, um, and talking about that, do you get a lot of hecklers in the sense of? I, I do, but I, I'll, I'll always shut them down in time as well. That doesn't normally get to that extreme with that little fella, although that was a lot of fun too. He, yeah. He a lot of the lines where I was pulling the piss out of him when he was there anyway. But, and, and in that situation, there was a... a big bouncer I know Robbie at the side of the stage there you can see at one point in that clip I look over at him and go I've got this you know he's saying I'm going to get rid of him and I go no it's all right I've got this so yeah not really a problem and those like Wayne House we mentioned earlier that those of, of my era of comedian always said that I was the one known for dealing with the hecklers the best yeah. there's a few heckle lines uh, out there as you guys know as comics there's standard lines that you don't use other people's material, but with hecklers, you can. Heckle lines are, we're fighting a common enemy and use what you can to shut them up, basically. There's a few heckle lines I've written over the years that are now the, the standard that are used by everyone. So that's kind of nice. That's cool. Can, can, can you give us an example? Um, well, I always take heckling as, as um, the things, the lines I use to shut up hecklers now as a performer I used to use to start fights in pubs when I was a drunk. Before I was <laughs> so yeah, um, uh, I made this is my job. I don't come down to your work and kick the sailors' cocks out of your mouth. Um, <laughs> I used to walk over pricks to get to a fight. <laughs> pricks like you to get to a fight. Yeah, um, I, I got tattoos and I'm not afraid to use them. Um, yeah. All, all those things, yeah. Oh, that's good. I think that with, with the after party too, or the bear pit, as you call it, I think that's why I can control the crowd a bit there is because I can say those things and I look like I mean it. Yeah. <laughs> no, if, if there's another MC up there that's your standard comic that's saying I'm going to fight you, they, they don't believe it. But <laughs> <laughs> if I say it, they go, fuck, maybe he will. Fuck off yeah. and make my cocktail, mate. Yeah, no, half on the bartenders. Yeah. Uh, talk, talking about heckling and that sort of thing, bombing. What's your worst ever bomb? I mean, like, you, you, have you bombed? Um, very early in the piece, and I, I don't even know if it was a bomb. Uh, it was where a heckler had got me, and it was only because I had no audience. Um, a pub in the western suburbs, Footscray in Melbourne. Um, yeah. A, a big hall type room at the side of the pub with no one in it. Uh, the stage was a couple of milk crates with a bit of chipboard on it. The <laughs> stage light was one of those screw in veranda lights, the white veranda lights. Absolutely no one in the room at the far end of our room, double doors. And through the double doors were an island bar of the public bar with two old blokes like the, the, the Waldorf and Statler from the Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting there, so they had direct line of sight to the comedian who was on stage to no one, but ignoring him with his back, with their back to them, still being in their bar. Oh wow! And just cutting all the open micers down. And I was, I was fairly new. I was probably six months into comedy, and <laughs> I'd, I'd said my first line. I can't even remember what it was. Got halfway through my first line after I was introduced, and one of them turned around and said, "Mate, would you shut up? Race eight's on." <laughs> no coming back to that. They're not even in the room. I mean, like, yeah. So that was my biggest bomb, I reckon. Fuck. Does that ever creep into your head when you when you're doing a gig? No. Well, since then, I've always had an audience. Yeah. I find that works better. <laughs> it's a key ingredient to a good yeah, one. <laughs> And do you have a routine that you go through? I mean, before you get on stage and that type of thing, do you sort of have a sort of a little ritual or? No, know? not really. Not really. Um, yeah, I, I, I've often thought about that because there's some comedians who won't have a meal before they perform. They'll, they'll only eat after. Uh, some people won't drink, but will drink heavily after or, or whatever. And 
no. If there's a meal offered, I'll eat it. If it's not offered, I won't eat it. But if there's beer there, I'll drink it. I've gone on blind drunk and I've gone on completely sober. So, yeah, yeah, yeah no, no real ritual at all. Okay. On stage, there's the ritual. Um, I always leave the mic in the stand. A lot of the comics these days take it out because so many there's so many American stand-up specials, I think, and the American mics take, uh, comedians take the mic out, wander the stage. But I'm I'm a lazy Australian, and uh, I figure someone's gone to the trouble of inventing something to hold that microphone. I don't. Take <laughs> <any effort. laughs> and in my early days, you could smoke at venues as well. So I always had a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. I had nothing to hold the microphone with anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fuck, there's not many rooms in Melbourne you could do that in anymore. No. no so you, you're giving up the smokes now, is that what you're saying? I'm still smoking, I just can't do it on stage. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, like, doors of country pubs where, where they decide to put you in beer gardens, you go, fuck yeah, I can smoke out here. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Do you have a, do you have a, do you have a favourite place in Australia to uh, gig? Oh, I haven't performed there for and it's it's changed there was a, a the gold coast art center used to have a great room upstairs um it was uh staged in a very wide room so they're only about two or three tables deep but over 100 people going sideways you know so it was a very wide room with a radio oh, wow. mic which i don't normally like but it was handy there because i could just get off stage halfway through my set and directly behind where the stage was, was where the bar, where they served everyone. So I could keep <laughs> doing my routine while I got a beer at the bar and go back. <laughs> That's brilliant. But, um, they moved that to a basement room downstairs, which was a, a lot of fun, but a bit more rowdy. It just wasn't the same as the one upstairs. So um, yeah. yeah, upstairs at the Gold Coast Art Centre was always a great place to work. Um, I, lo- I love the Exford in Melbourne. Um, yeah. The after party only ever happens in the public bar during the comedy festival. The room upstairs is a weekly room on a Thursday night, I think, maybe a Wednesday. Uh, yeah, I think and it's Thursday, yeah. Thursday, yeah. They don't generally get a big crowd in there, but it's always good fun. It's good camaraderie amongst the comedians, which is a, a great Melbourne trait. I find comedians will hang out at venues, whether they're on, or if, even after they've been on, they'll hang around for the rest of the show or whatever. That, that doesn't happen in all the other states, so... I always love that about Melbourne. Yeah, that that is a that is a thing that's ca- catching on. Well, I mean, was what was catching on before all this lockdown shit happened. But um, yeah, it's it's good when comics stick around and have a mm. drink afterwards and talk shit. And yeah, yeah. What well, what what about Tassie? What was the scene like in Tassie? Are you active down there? It, it's pretty good. There's a there's a weekly room on a Wednesday night in Hobart called Joker's Comedy Club. It's run yep. by Gavin Baskerville. Yep. Um, and there's a, a couple of weeklies, uh, open mic nights around Hobart as well. Here in Launceston, we generally have a, a monthly um, pro night. Uh, it's run by Stuart Bell. Fresh Comedy is the company. Oh, yeah. um, and he'll bring a headliner down from uh, the mainland all the time. So it'll be uh, uh, Heath Franklin doing Chopper or Mikey Robbins or, you know, he'll, he'll have Daniel Sloss come down or, uh, you know, yeah. if he's in Australia. So yep. always quality headliner and uh, occasionally I'll jump up and do a support or whatever that, at Stu's request. Yep. Um, uh, but having said that, that's only monthly. Um, and I, I could probably do it as a support once or twice a year. Yep. And the same with Jokers, I could headline that once or twice a year because it's a repeat audience in smaller cities. I can't jump up every week because, I, as I said earlier in the chat, yep. I'm, I'm not much of a writer. Yep. I, I, yeah. Joker's is a really cool room. I, I went there um, about a year ago, I think. But yeah, no, it's a, that, that's a beautiful place. Yeah. yeah do, 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 do they pack out? It, it can on occasion. Um, yeah. It depends who's on. I, I've, I've done probably six to yeah six or seven shows there in the in the four and a half years I've been down here, and yeah. some have been chock a block, and some have been about half full, three quarter full. But it, it, there's never a it's never empty, if you know what I mean. There's always yeah. a crowd there to perform. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful room. Um, highly recommend anyone listening, if you're down in Tassie, to check it out. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. Re- really good place. What about your, um, what about for you? What were your influences? I mean, when you first, what? your influences. Influences. Yeah, yeah, comedy. I mean, 
I've mentioned Cole Elliott a couple of times. Uh, uh, I grew up listening to him. When, when when I was growing up as a child on the Mornington Peninsula there, um, Dad was in the Navy and then the Merchant Navy. So he was away for a month at a time and then home for a month. And in the month he was away, my mother had let me stay up late on a school night and watch Monty Python's Flying Circus with us. Yeah. I've got a lot of that British comedy. Des O'Connor were all stand-up comedians, you know, that had TV specials, the two Ronnies. Yeah. All of that sort of British influence. And um, when Dad was home, we'd, we'd be down in the back shed listening to Cole Elliott cassettes. You can't help laughing with Cole, the, the bawdy, filthy Australian sort of stuff. So I think those two things influenced me the most. And I've, I've, I've sort of got a mix between the two of them. Oh, that's good. Do, do, do you uh, listen or watch much comedy now? Like people are going Not around at the moment? Performing. It's really strange. I, I, I've been performing for well, probably three years and someone mentioned out that I had a joke that they thought was a Bill Hicks joke. And I, I said, who's Bill Hicks? Because I, I just don't watch comedy. Yeah. And I had a look and I, it was a very similar joke, but it was one part of his joke and one part of my joke that both went in very different directions. Yeah. But with a, with a oh, hello, you just oh. fell off. <laughs> Are you back with me? Yeah, yeah, we're here. Righto. Yeah, so there was one part which were the same words, but they were both five to ten minute routines where nothing else was the same in them, you know? Wow. So I I, um, I, I chose to continue doing it. I knew within me that I wasn't doing that line because I'd seen Bill Hicks do it. I didn't know who Bill Hicks was. Yeah. But, um, yeah, um, Lewis C.K., everyone for a while was jumping on the Lewis C.K. bandwagon I, I, until... <laughs> Yeah. Turned out to be a wanker, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't watch comedy, so I, I you know, I, I didn't get into it, didn't watch it. Um, and nowadays, uh, with this day and age, we've got Netflix and all of those sorts of things, and every second show on Netflix is a comedy stand up special, and I'm, I just don't watch them. I, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, strange. It, it'd be like uh, someone who works as a carpenter coming home and putting on a YouTube clip of how to make a table. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. That's fair enough. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know times are very, very different uh, compared to when you started out, but when, what, what sort of uh, advice would you give comics who are looking at putting material out or uh, starting stand up kind of thing? Like what, what advice would you pass on them? I can give advice on how to structure your routines. Um, I, I wouldn't really give advice on how to put it out there or, or go via social media because I'm 55 and it's all new to me. So the kids starting out would know more about the, the technology side of it than I would. But um, in terms of structure, as I said earlier, I, the way I find if a joke's funny is try it three different times to get an audience to like it. Yeah. Um, and if you're trying to build up a... a a, a backlog of material, I guess. Work on five minutes. Don't try and write now. Write your five minutes. Keep doing that at open mic places until you've got that five minutes solid. If there's one joke that continually bombs in that five minutes, fuck it off and put another joke in there. Yeah. And keep replacing it until that joke you've replaced works. Until that everything in that five minutes is solid laughter. Then put that five aside and start the whole procedure again. So you've got another solid five. Yep. Then put that five with the first five and you've got 10 minutes all of a sudden you're half a support act, you know? Yep. And oh, that's very solid advice. Five minute blocks. Work on each five minutes till it's really tight and then add it to the others that you've got. Had, uh, that's very good. Apart from the, uh, apart from the, the trying it three times sort of thing, is, is that your definitive way of knowing whether a joke sticks or do you have someone you run stuff by like a, a, a mate who if you can crack no. them you can crack anyone sort of thing or? no no there, there are people that do that i mean um my missus here would have left long ago if i was running everything past her <laughs> <laughs> she goes like even now i'll try something she goes i've told you years ago you're not fucking funny <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, I'm sure there's people that have got mates that will do that, but if they're too good a mate, they're going to tell you everything's funny anyway. The best way is on stage for strangers. I'll give you an honest opinion. 
Yeah. yeah. And because you're not writing, I mean, does it change up? Do the jokes change from time to time? As in, like, you've got the same joke, but the wording change at all? Or do you sort of just keep it? Only, only in new jokes. Uh-huh. Um, once I've found a way that it's working, I'll try and remember how I said it that way. And um, if I word a joke differently, it's funny for me because my 40, 45 minutes set now goes in exactly the same order all the way through. It, it's a recital more than anything. So if I say something differently there, it'll, it'll throw me out for, you know, what, what fucking follows that, I, you know, if I've said it differently. So I, I basically say everything word for word every time. The trick is making the audience think you're, say, think you're saying it for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very solid advice. I've heard that before. Oh, that's good. But have you ever had a, uh, have you ever it looked at a crowd and thought, oh, oh shit, shit, I don't know how I'm going to get these guys over? Like, has anyone ever set you up to fail sort of thing before, I mean, before you got up? Um, there's situations where, where it can yeah. happen. Um, uh, an unprofessional MC at a sportsman's night, it might be the president of the club or whatever, who wouldn't know how to, to set up an introduction properly or, you know, that there might be a time where you're, you're doing a sportsman's night and they've had an auction and then a guest um, sportsman speaker. And oh, just before we bring the comedian on, we'd like to pause for a minute and remember Bill from our club. He was in Treasury. He died last Tuesday. Oh. And um, and now, now here's this bloke for a bit of comedy. Uh, it can be a bit hard that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, but... Uh, Fuck. <laughs> yeah. You learn over the years how to deal with all that sort of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Generally, if I get a bad intro, I'll spend the first five minutes letting the MC know and get the laugh out of the crowd with that. I was going to invite you down to my room when it reopens, but that, that makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get on your bad side. Fuck the that. The press is on you now, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's done a song. You may have heard it. <laughs> a 20-minute glowing intro for a five-minute spot. <laughs> like, oh, no, mate. You, you'd get longer than five minutes. Don't worry. Um, do, do you ever get people... I'm always curious. Like, do you ever get people, like, you know, reciting lines from from bloke at you yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's all right at gigs when i'm singing it and they're singing along but uh if i'm at a, a family function or you know a party a, a, maybe one of my stepdaughters having a 25th and some of her friends are there who have never met me before but knew i was a stepdad they'll be all excited about being there to meet me and they'll, they'll start singing bloke to me and i'll go yeah i know how it goes mate <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like I've heard it enough of me fucking singing it. I don't want you fucking it up in front of me at your stepdaughter's birthday party. So it's getting a bit old now? People coming well, up to you? 98. So 97, I started singing it. 98, I performed it in the Raw final. 2000, it came out as a song. So if we yeah. go from 98, that's 22 years I've been singing it before ISO, four times a week. Yeah. Uh, I was over it when it came out as a single when everyone else was <laughs> I'd already been hearing it for two years before that. So. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, it's a very clever song. I, 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 I do like the old parody. It's very good. Oh, thanks, man. And, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a very, very big... I remember when it came out, it was a massive talking point at school. I remember coming home one day because my mate let me the CD and I think I bought it anyway. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I told told my mum I he wanted to be a bogey. You burnt it. You burnt it. No, 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 no. I've, I've <laughs> never, never. No. I don't think so. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> you did. You <laughs> don't did. Well, look, 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 between now and then, if I if I come to the realization that I did in fact burn it, I'll send you a carton of something. Um, but <laughs> I'll. To, don't be that generous. You only owe me nine ninety nine. No, inflation. <laughs> Inflation. I've got. I've got family in Tassie. I'll, I'll, I'll get them to drop it off. It's fine. Um, uh, I remember coming home one day and telling Mum I wanted to be a bogan. She's like, "No." I was like, "All right." <laughs> that was it. Like, it was a massive song. Sadly, sadly, bogan's got a bad stigma. But um, you know, it, it's a it's a way of life. It's enjoying V8 supercars, Aussie pub rock music beer and having fun but it doesn't mean you can't be intelligent or or a you know a 
a, a feminist or, or you know a, a caring person or believe in gay rights or, or you know um, worry about indigenous rights or you know I, I'm, I'm pro all of those things and I, I consider myself very bogan and, and, and well educated so yeah it's it, a bit weird you know, it, it's got a stigma it yeah. does it does maybe write a song about that that'd be entertaining <laughs> That'd be good. I do the 2020 version of bloke. I'll call it woke. <laughs> <laughs> just don't, just don't go as far as putting auto tune on and all that sort of shit. <laughs> Please don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, speak, speaking of Aussie pub rock, who, who's your, who's your top top bands? Um, well, they're, they're, they're a world headlining act now, but ACDC were an Aussie pub band. Yeah. Um, the Angels, Rose Tattoo, The Radiators, Screaming Jets, yeah. you know, all the classics. Um, I like Chisholm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a hint, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I want. I want to ask if you know my friend who works with someone who was part of Tism, but I don't want to name names. So that would be a giveaway. But yeah, no, we'll keep it we'll keep it at that. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> but if you if you release another video and there's a fucking balaclava in the background, I'm calling it you're part of Tism. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just happy to play that <laughs> Can you open up your closet there real quick? <laughs> See if you got any jumpsuits in there. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Smash the guitar. No, no jumpsuits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on. No, I don't recognise that. Uh, that's a onesie. <laughs> Close. <laughs> All right, look, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, but I believe you. Yeah, cool. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most diplomatic way I can put it. <laughs> aren't, I, aren't I too old or too young to be in TISM? Oh, does TISM have an age? Who knows? Like, yeah. Like you just have to know the songs, don't you? I, I wouldn't be able to name any of their songs to you. I, <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't name Greg the stop sign. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, once, really. once we get back, do you think there's going to be much change with uh, the comedy scene, the, the, the whole... It's an interesting one. I, I've thought about it. I, I, in, in my fantasy world, I'd like to think everyone's dying to get back out there and have a laugh and have a good time and it's going to be good for everyone. But I also think from how I myself react when I'm out in public these days at the supermarket or whatever, I, I tend to distance myself more so and be conscious of it. Yeah. So I'm worried that might happen in bars and clubs too. Um, I think that when we're allowed back in pubs, which apparently is going to be the last business allowed to reopen, uh, pubs and clubs, um, I think the first week or so there's going to be a shitload of fights in pubs. Because yeah. people are going to be worried about people being too close. People are going to get drunk a lot easier. Um, yeah. Didn't even so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think the first week of pubs reopening is going to be uh, a busy week for the bouncers out there. Oh, yep. Sorry, Norman. Not allowed to call them bouncers. Insinuates <laughs> uh, they bounce you out of venue. You've got to call them Norman <laughs> now. No, I know why. You've got to call them dormant because they're normally six foot tall, three foot wide, and they've got little knobs on the front of them. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to all the bouncers I know. <laughs> Benny, Benny, you were a bouncer at one point, weren't you? <laughs> I was. I, I worked as a bouncer until uh, they brought licensing in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, no, it's, that's a, that's a, a very interesting observation. It'll, it'll be that's something I didn't even think of. Uh, yeah. Violence being an issue, so that's a scary thought. But. Yeah, yeah. 
Hopefully not. Um, I, I think though also we need a date that the clubs and pubs are going to open again before we can even start booking. So um, yeah. when they say it'll all be over soon and everyone can go back to work, we won't be able to because we're, we're going to need another three months after that to for venues to be able to promote the show. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for us to book them in, all of that sort of thing, put a tour together. Yeah. And yeah, so it, yeah, it's going to be a little bit longer than everyone else. Oh, but it'll be worth it when it comes back, I hope. Oh, yeah. We're all hanging to get on stage. And ironically, I think even veterans that have been doing it for 20-odd for years are going to be quite nervous getting back in front of an audience after not being there for a little while. Yeah. It's almost like a, <laughs> someone's hit the reset button. Yeah, yeah. What I'm not looking forward to when when we all get back into it is the amount of fucking COVID-19 jokes on the first night. Yeah, no, I can't be fucked with that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Every second act will have a parody. Oh god. I hope not. Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> this is yeah, like it's yeah, no, I just I, I think I'm I'm hoping people will get it out of the system like, you know, chatting to mates or um, posting your memes and all that sort of shit. And they actually won't feel the need to do it on stage because that'd just be fucking painful. Imagine an hour of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there'll be a few out there they'll be doing it they'll just be like fucking then we'll have to go into bouncer mode sorry dormant mode and just fucking <laughs> keep them out <laughs> I, I want to MC the first gig I do back and call that a, as the MC if anyone does a COVID-19 joke I'm turning off the PA and fucking dragging them off stage <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good idea yeah I just, I, I just, I just don't think anyone could be fucked with it. Like you've all gone through this. We've all, everyone's affected in one way or another. Um, I just don't think yeah, anyone will, yeah, no need for it. will have a tolerance yeah. for it. Yeah. Hey, do you guys normally do this podcast with yourselves, like without a guest? Uh, a bit of both. So <laughs> before all this shit happened, I'd, I'd be at Benny's place and yeah, sweet. Um, we'd just be chatting. Um, it's, do you want to do a bit of that for about three minutes? Because I'm dying for a slash. I had burnt lasagna. Sorry, Anna cooked burnt lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Hey, buddy. How you going? Good, uh, man. So what were you talking about while I was gone? Uh, Benny got served burnt lasagna by his wife <laughs> last night. Oh, nice. Yeah. Sorry. You might, might have to have a word with her. No, no, it was all right. No, no, no words. <laughs> it was a great meal. Best meal I've ever had. <laughs> that means she's sitting in the garden and can hear him. Yeah, yeah. You can always get another one. <laughs> lasagna no, or what? Are you talking about lasagna or what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, feminism. Um, oh, fuck, what was I going to say? Um, who who would be one of the biggest acts you've toured with or performed with? Gee, um, I, I opened for Tom Green at Melbourne Comedy Festival on oh, two separate years. Did did some shows with Tom. That was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of comedy, that he's probably the biggest. I mean, there's a lot of guys that are on those um, ABC UK. TV shows um, that have come out to Melbourne to do festival runs, and I've ended up pretty drunk with them in the festival club. Johnny <laughs> Vegas and a few people like that. But Johnny Vegas, um, holy yeah, shit! Yeah, we, we got very drunk together once. Or, <laughs> I think it was once. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, but in terms of shows, yeah, uh, opening for Tom was pretty cool. That would have been a loose was, night. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I saw you did, uh, you went to Canada, I think it was, yeah, last year? Uh, I, I go every year. From how, how do you find that, that audience? I mean, how do you find the sort of... The, I just go to the venue and they're there. I, I don't have to find them. They just... <laughs> you got a sound effect for that, don't you? Yeah, I do, actually, but... Yeah. <laughs> Put it in the <laughs> 
No, but, they're, they're, the Canadians are fine. They they sound American, but they've got a British sense of humour. Yeah. You know, they 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 they're all part of the the, the Commonwealth. Um, they they I always say they're like Aussies with a with an American accent. Have you done Have you done your stand up to the Americans at all? As in, have you done any American gigs? No, no. I, I, um, I've uh, stood on the stage at the Comedy Store in LA, but that was through a mate of mine who lives in LA, and it was after hours, and they opened up for me just to stand up on the stage and get a feel for the place. So, but, cool. no, we were going back to Canada in October this year, but we don't know if that's happening at yeah, the moment. The international travel thing uh, that would have been our third year over there for a month around that time of year getting quite a following in Canada and last year we spent two weeks in LA before we went up to Canada um, the boss Michelle didn't think too much of <laughs> much of it they say I, I wanted because I'd been there before I wanted her to see it and I said what, what do you think of LA and she said you can tell we're not in fucking Canada so uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, next year we'll probably go straight through unless I've, I've got a few friends there and if they can see up a gig, I'd love to do something in America. Would, yeah, you, yeah. would you change up your gig? As in, would you change it up at all for that sort of audience or would you just... Yeah, I, I, I would talk a lot slower for the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I would probably do what I've just said not to do over here about five minutes of COVID material just made <laughs> around that um, brilliant physician they've got as a as a president. <laughs> Mr. Bleach himself, yeah. <laughs> yeah, your skin colour says otherwise. Oh, I think you know. <laughs> I don't think he's on much bleach. Mm. <laughs> he needs to be on something. <laughs> just not on a fucking podium. Yeah. 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 <laughs> fucking nutcase. Uh, it, it has been an absolute pleasure yeah, talking to you, mate. Thank you um, very much for this. Ne next time you're in Melbourne, please get in touch. Yep. Will for sure, guys. I've had a ball. Been no, a good job. Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd love to get you back in, in the actual studio when um, when all the shit blows over and we'll see how you're travelling. Um, yeah, but, but pro probably see two weeks of isolation. I'll talk to fucking anyone, but, but <laughs> once I'm allowed out again, I, I probably won't talk to you blokes again. Yeah, you know? fair enough. Oh, awesome. yeah. That's, that's fair enough. <laughs> I don't want to even what you in the street. That's, 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 our whole, that's our whole audience. That's fine. <laughs> I would love to come and have a chat in the studio, boys. Oh, that's a brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, lo long time <laughs> fan, first time t chatting to you. So this has been a blast, man. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good on you, Geordie. Thanks, mate. Thank you, Chris. Much appreciated for this. No worries, Benny. Anytime, mate. Cheers, Chris. Stay safe. See you, bye.